So please join me in welcoming Ted Sutton. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be in here pinch hitting for uh, Bob Sopak, and I'm delighted to be able to share some of the Blanchard Project experience and, of course, uh, some of the lessons we think we've learned. And I hope to be able to, to pass on the occasional thought-provoking slide or comment, and please don't throw heavy objects. Uh, much of what we're going to talk about here is located on the Keystone Ag Producers website, and I've put the web uh, location down there for you. And I think all of these slide presentations are going to be made available after the fact. So uh, if you don't get it all, you can certainly just uh, Google Keystone Ag Producers and they'll tag you along the way there. So the alternative land use services concept is to develop a delivery model for conservation and stewardship. Um, it is to encourage the production of ecological goods and services, which I, I, I think we're talking about the same thing when Vic talks about ecosystem services or environmental services. It's different names for the same thing. But here we're talking specifically to the privately owned agricultural landscape in Canada, and we are talking about financial incentives in terms of paying ag producers to deliver those ecological goods and services. The ultimate goal is a large-scale landscape conservation program. And, and I, my next slide is going to talk about large-scale, and I don't want to give the impression that we think that Alice is going to be a panacea. There's certainly room uh, and a lot of room for the conservation easement and for outright ownership, but uh, we have some comments and things we think we've learned from this kind of project in terms of how do you develop greater participation from farmers, private landowners. And certainly we've, we've found that flexibility, uh, the land lease agreement uh, is, is, uh, is f familiar to farmers. That's a very common practice in the agricultural community is to rent land. And so that the, uh, the rental agreement process gets a fairly good reception and requires very little in the way of explanation. Uh, I said before, the financial incentive-based uh, it needs to be fair, it needs to be market-based. Uh, in the Blanchard project, the price determination was largely done through consultation with farmer advisory groups based on opportunity cost. The terms and conditions need to be responsive to farmers' needs as well as providing measurable ecological goods and services. And uh, um, the second half of that measurable ecological goods and services was really not entirely accomplished in this project simply because it only ran for three years. And it takes longer than that to, to adequately quantify uh, just how much good you're doing the environment over a three-year haul. So, so we're saying that, that uh, the efforts of this, uh, of this project to define terms and conditions are really designed for a longer implementation period. It needs to be in dynamic state. One of the things about flexibility that you lose is you lose that sense of permanence. You lose the long-term security of, say, that particular specific wetland in favor of broad participation. And, and there's very little way to get one, and you can't have your cake and eat it too, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so the notion of the conservation bank system and, and I'll speak specifically to wetlands, but there are certainly uh, other conceptual conservation programs that could be applied to this, is that if you have 10,000 acres of wetlands tied up in a series of 10-year leases, uh, you are going to lose some and you'll gain some. And at the end of the day, you should still have your 10,000 acres of wetlands. It's like the city of Calgary. If there are a million people here today and a million people tomorrow, they won't be the same million people. Some people will have arrived, some people will have left. The dynamic state concept is critical to the notion of having the flexible land lease agreement and still satisfy the need to have some sense of permanency. So with that digression, uh, I, I apologize if this is old news for everybody, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to run over it again, and it goes back to my teaching roots. Uh, wildlife conservation. Endangered species recovery, improved air quality, and carbon sequestration 
And I would venture to say that nitrogen sequestration and control of NOx is not that far away from being on the agenda as well. Clean water, groundwater recharge, flood control are all examples of, of ecological goods and services. Another, another uh, aside here is the business of beneficial or best management practices. This project was targeted to having farmers change their management practices uh, for a great, for a, a very specific fee-for-service arrangement. Its ability, as I alluded to earlier, to really get a handle on EG&S is, is difficult because of the length of the project. But it's important to remember that best management practices is a means, ecological goods and services is an outcome, uh, by and large, management practices are based on the principle that polluter pays. Ag producers are responsible for maintaining a certain level of environmental stewardship. And the trend certainly is to develop compliance baselines for what constitutes acceptable, if not best, management practices. Um, the notion, therefore, is that the farmer has that responsibility and is not going to receive compensation for that level of performance. Voluntary activities that go beyond the compliance baseline could be considered part of society's responsibility, and therefore, and this is the argument that we're putting forward, compensation may be paid to the producer. So we are trying to distinguish between those two levels of stewardship. The context for Alice in an agricultural setting is that society is placing demands on farmers and ranchers to provide environmental benefits, Conservation departments are implementing more and more of a regulatory agenda, uh, species at risk, drainage regulations, uh, DFO, Manitoba's new phosphorus regulations, uh, PEI buffer zones. I, would, I should say here while we've got PEI up that uh, uh, Prince Edward Island is the first province in Canada to have a province-wide ALICE program. They funded it, announced it early this spring, and it's already in place. Um, producers not in a position to bear the additional cost to produce ecological services and protect natural capital at the same time. So we've talked about the loss of natural capital. We've heard about that. How do we, how do we manage to encourage farmers not, not to mine, what was the thing that Brad used, mining our natural capital, uh, to not do that. The other issue here is world trade. And world trade talks continue to redefine the nature of farm support programs and Alice and conservation programs like ALICE are considered green box, which means they're trade neutral. And finally, there is the opportunity to enlist the rural community to produce ecological goods and services, and, and that's more of a political kind of a, a, a grassroots movement that uh, Mr. Manning alluded to in, in terms of getting that community charged up about, about the value of EG&S and, and the value of doing good stewardship. Another old slide, which I hope isn't too redundant, uh, private landowners think they own the land. Well, the fact of the matter is they own the soil, the crop, the livestock, and the trees, but the remainder of those resources really belong to the general public. The problem comes when the general public abrogates its responsibility for ongoing management of some of those things. And so, if you look at a slough in a farmer's field, who does it really belong to? And therefore, whose responsibility is it to ensure that proper stewardship is being provided? And more to the point, who should bear the cost of doing it?